Peace and love, everybody. This is Mike and Forty, a.k.a. Manny Faces. I'm the executive producer of Newsbeat, our podcast series that melds journalism, music, uh, voices from experts and people in, involved in uh, interesting issues, and hip-hop. I'm joined here today by uh, Chris Tawarski, our editor-in-chief, and Rashed Mian, the managing editor of Newsbeat. What up, guys? Hey. What up, Manny? All right, so check it out. We're here talking about the uh, the War on Drugs episode. Uh, so this is, of course, hopefully you guys have, have checked it out already. Uh, fantastic episode. Uh, our, our real kind of uh, evolution from our pilot episode, the MLK Junior Unfinished Business episode. We've evolved to our current form, and it's a, it's a great uh, blending of different voices and, and different uh, ideas. And, of course, we have a great hip-hop performance all mixed in. So... Assuming you guys checked it out already, we're here to kind of talk about it a little bit behind the scenes, give you some, you know, a little bit of insight as to what went into the episode and what we got out of the episode and what hopefully you got out of the episode. Sounds good? Let's do it. Chris? Yeah, so loosely we titled this episode Racism, Weed, and Jazz, The True Origins of the War on Drugs. And what it is, it's a forensic look to just where this uh, U.S.-led, now global war began. And, um, you know, I think most people believe that it was uh, President Nixon or President Reagan uh, that launched the war on drugs, and that's not true. It really boils down to one singular man named Harry Anslinger. Rashad, why don't you tell us about some of the people who uh, were interviewed for this? Yeah, so I think the great thing about Backbeat is that we get to expand on some of the themes that we touched on in uh, the Newsbeat episode, and especially talk a little more about our guests. So when I was uh, researching the War on Drugs episode, which I should say began with our publisher at a conference, and he was uh, listening in on a panel, I think it was about mass incarceration, uh, something to that effect. And in it, they had mentioned the War on Drugs, but how it started as a war against weed, against marijuana. He sort of took note of that and he came back into the office and we were sort of befuddled because we all just consider the war on drugs as a, a Richard Nixon creation and then even when I started researching the war on drugs I was pulling up articles from mainstream news outlets talking about how the war on drugs is a four decade old war and then when you find out that it started with as Chris mentioned this this man named Harry Anslinger who ran parallel basically to J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI. So it's interesting because you have these two men who are so influential in the policies that affected a lot of brown and black people uh, decades ago. And some of those policies continue to this day, including the war on drugs, um, which has contributed to this mass incarceration problem that we have today. So when I was researching the episode, I came across a journalist and author named Johan Hari, who I thought if we were able to get him would be the perfect person for our listeners to hear from about the war on drugs. In my estimation, he probably wrote the definitive book on the war on drugs, which he he probably is too humble to say that. But I urge everybody to read this book. It's an eye opener. The book is called Chasing the Scream. Um, has a long subtitle, but that Chasing the Scream is by Johan Hari. And in it, he, he starts off right away, just like most of us, saying he came to the United States. He wanted to learn more about the war on drugs. You know, he, th- he had preconceived notions. And then, boom, he found out about Anslinger and the origins. So, and, and the Billie Holiday part, which, of course, was, you know, led off the episode, was, a, I mean, an eye-opener in of itself, you know, just to see how not only was, the, was Anslinger doing these things that you heard about in the episode, but that he like really started like targeting this particular person and then but as an offshoot, those kinds of people. Right. So it, it, that's exactly because Anslinger, for, <laughs> for some strange reason, had, as Johan says in the episode, had a deep distaste for black people and jazz music. He just thought jazz music was some barbarian artistry that sort that black people used black males used mostly to seduce white women. That's a theme that our other guest, Maya Solovitz, also touches on, how the drug war was also used as a way to sort of protect white women from black men. Right, this um, fear-mongering this, uh, th- that she says uh, was created out of nothing, created out of no facts, but just this racist viewpoint. Right, and the, the facts are important because, um, again, which uh, Johan documents 
is Anslinger reached out to 30 scientists to get information about marijuana. Is it dangerous? How dangerous? 29 of the 30 scientists came back and said, this is, you know, essentially no big deal. Marijuana use is not that terrible for people. Which he, he reminded us was legal at the right, time. Right, which was legal at, uh, you know, at the time. Before Anslinger shut it down. <laughs> and then he takes the one scientist out of 30 who had something negative to say about marijuana. He used that to create this policy that we still have to this day. And just to understand, you know, some of these deranged notions, which when you read some of the quotes attributed to Anslinger, you're more than going to scratch your head. So in one quote, in which Anslinger is attributed, he says, there are 100,000 total marijuana smokers in the U.S., and most are Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers. Their satanic music, jazz, and swing result from marijuana use. This marijuana causes white women to seek sexual relations with Negroes, and he goes on and on. So as you can tell right there... This guy's not mincing words. Yeah, and this is something that we... Something we couldn't get into the episode because we can't get everything, pack everything in there, but... This is important just to understand why this guy created this war on drugs, why he carried it out the way he did, and the policies that he lobbied for that led to laws on the books that we still have to this day. I think it was crazy because people hear that the you know the overwhelming majority of, of people who are in jail for marijuana possession or drug offenses in general but marijuana for, for you know specifically are people of color uh, men of you know of color specifically uh, you know in a disproportionate amount so we hear these things and it's kind of talked about and bandied about and people kind of now i think are a little bit more aware of this that people starting to get aware of the mass incarceration problem and saying that it's become racist you know but this kind of shows that it was always racist that it that's it specifically why it started and specifically was the intent right and that's why i think this episode is so important because when you consider think back to the presidential race between donald trump and hillary clinton and her husband hillary clinton's husband bill clinton's uh bill clinton's 1994 crime bill which if you go back into the video to video of his press conference he believed was his legacy legislation, which he later had to apologize for basically because it led to, you know, such policies as three strikes you're out. Right. So, you know, if you get caught with three drug offenses over time, you're stuck in prison basically forever. Right. Um, And I mean, the, the, and if for 40 years, the policies have been, you get the black and brown people for those offenses, in a disproportionate amount, here you're going to have disproportionate amount of people who are in jail for ridiculously long times, uh, and of course leads to other societal issues. You know, the breakup of the family, and uh, you know, you have a felony. Maybe you get out in some time, but now you have a felony. You can't vote. You can't do certain things. Can't get certain loans. Right, right. So that that it's it it snowballed that whole effect uh, with what was, I guess, some people. You know, it's strange because the you know you would think a oh, war on drugs is good, right? It's it's good to get these. Things out of society, you know, the, the dealers and 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 get addicts the help they need. But as uh, Maya talked about, uh, and as uh, a third guest uh, talked about, you don't they, they don't get the help they need, and now you're also putting people in jail at a disproportionate amount that you know shouldn't be you know saddled with that kind of penalty. Yeah, and that the third guest you're referring to is Alex Clermont, who is a uh, prison reform activist, and we uh, met up with him, and he also talked about how um, the way we battle addiction issues is in some ways just totally backwards. I mean, these are people with serious, um, potentially, you know, mental issues, uh, other physical issues. And there's, a, there's more, these, not, these people who are using these drugs are necessarily just bad people. I think it's important to put the, the war on drugs in context, especially when you learn that what we have today and what we will have far into the foreseeable future came from the mind of one singular man. More than a trillion dollars of taxpayer funds has been spent over the last 40 years uh, waging this war. Trillion with a T. With a T. Yeah. As we know, locking people up in great numbers doesn't, doesn't slow down the amount of drugs and doesn't help addicts get clean. Right. So just locking them up, as Alex said, is just, you know, kind of a, a, a cover up issue to you know, just kind of throw them in jail. And right. I mean, that, and, a, and a trillion dollars. Right. To do all that? Right. Right. So more than a trillion spent. Currently, there's over 450,000 people incarcerated for drug offenses. 
up from 40,000 in 1980, and yet America remains the number one country in the world for illicit drug use. Hmm. And as we could tell with the opiate epidemic, which is ravaging many parts of this country, um, record numbers of people are dying of overdoses because they're not getting the necessary treatment that they need. And again, uh, it's, it's, not, it's, it's tough not to stress this, but again, it starts with one singular person. And this was a person in Anslinger who also championed these policies away from the United States. He, he was representative for the U.S. and the United Nations, mm. and he pushed for other countries to combat drugs the way uh, he was in the U.S., um, specifically with Mexico. At the time, most of the drugs were legal, um, and he pushed for them to be prohibited. And there was one man, a doctor, that Johan mentions, who said, no, this is a bad idea. You should treat these, you should treat people instead of locking them up. And he, he sort of advocated for Mexico retaining the policies they already had. But Anslinger eventually strong armed Mexico into fighting this drug war. Hmm. Um, so, you know, when you think about it, this, he did not just change national policies. Uh, he changed international policies. Hmm. Um, and now we have um, people like Attorney General Jeff Sessions, who's talking about bringing back the war on drugs. He's already quoted uh, Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign. Right, which we heard, and, and uh, Johan pointed out that uh, many of the people who participated in that very campaign actually had a higher rate of drug usage. It, like, it, it doesn't work. It didn't help. And, uh, and I think, he, as he says in, in the episode, it's, it's a fundamental misunderstanding of how addiction works. Right, right. It doesn't solve the problem. Yeah, and if you think about it, if you just sat down and thought about this without any preconceived notions about drugs, if you just looked at the numbers, you just couldn't believe that, it, as Chris mentioned, a trillion dollars has been sent just in the last 40 years alone. And we're mm-hmm. talking about a, a drug war that started in, in the, the 1930s, right. um, a war against weed. When you think about the number of people that are incarcerated, the money that goes into that. So there's over 2.2 million people in the U.S. incarcerated in prisons and jails. Mm. And nearly half of those people in federal prisons are locked up for drug offenses. Right. And it's obviously expensive to house these people in these prisons that are already overcrowded. Right. And then you think about the current opiate epidemic. It's apparent that the war on drugs is a total failure. But no one wants to give this up. Not one president wants to curtail this war on drugs. You could say start with Nixon. Even so, Nixon escalated the drug war. Ronald Reagan took off with it. Then you had Bill Clinton with his 1994 crime bill. A Democrat, (laughs) right, who pushed it even further by imprisoning a lot of people. And and disproportionately, these were black and brown people that were being locked up for these crimes. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, for me... Uh, when you listen to the episode, uh, I have to give a shout out to Silent Night, an extra special shout out to Silent Night. Yeah. Just absolutely encapsulating this little known tale with a level of passion and sincerity and rage that I feel when I listen to it. These are the voices of all these hundreds of thousands of people, you know, incarcerated, the countless people who have been killed. Uh, yeah. Not just in the U.S. globally, right. um, and say the families, you know, families from, ripped apart from mm-hmm. drugs. You know, families ripped apart. I mean, how yeah. you put a price tag on and 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 quantify uh, the the true cost of of waging this war? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so can I? And please. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Silent Night. Uh, you know, and shouts to SK for uh, contributing verses to this project as he did to our inaugural project. So musically, what we wanted to do. Uh, with this episode was kind of you know there's a there's that that whole initial part with Billie Holiday and the uh, and the strange fruit interpolation that we used and 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 that she was so instrumental we wanted to kind of have a jazzy feel to it you know but something that also kind of has a little solemn undertone to it so that was purposely why we kind of put it together because it's telling this tale that does have extreme ramifications but also kind of you know just gives a little nod to the jazz age a little nod to you know to where this this story began and and the the first victims. I suppose of of these policies, and uh, just putting that together musically, having Silent Night come in and and amplify, not only you know reiterate or 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 put an exclamation point on the historical aspects of what the episode is telling you, but also like you said, Chris, bringing in that passion, bringing in the that you know speaking on behalf of you know those who are affected by it. It's just a masterful job, and and uh, once again, you know, gave us. Uh, Gave us chills to listen to his 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 perspective and and his you know interpretation of 
what this whole thing is all about. Yeah, and quickly, for the people who don't know Silent Night, and Chris and I going into this, uh, we weren't really familiar with Silent Night's work, but now um, we are just, you know, in awe of uh, of what he produces, especially what he produced for us in this episode. Yeah. Uh, so you can just give people uh, just an idea of who Silent Night is? Yeah, for sure. Silent Night uh, is a uh, New York, New Jersey nomad of sorts, <laughs> uh, represents uh, the New York City area. He's been an independent artist for a long time, for so, you know, for many years, uh, performing as a solo artist. He's also the front man of the band called Fuse. Uh, these guys are a great fusion band that blends together genres of you know hip hop and rock and soul and and uh, and funk and, and and puts together these great uh, musical soundscapes that uh, you know SK and of course uh, Soul Clock and K Dez, other vocalists in the group that really come together uh, and and form this great um, this great musical experience uh, that I think everyone should check out. So if if you obviously if you like Silent Night's work he has a lot of great you know, solo material and of course the band called Fuse also so you could find them eh, you know you know how to use Google you know Silent Night with a K like a knight in chess Silent Night uh, the band called Fuse is actually th- called the band called Fuse so that's how you guys would uh, would find them online Spotify and all that stuff yeah and we're definitely uh, on the hunt for other uh, independent artists who speak to some of these issues and um, we are coming to you just um, minutes after arriving from Albany New York um, yeah, newsbeat on the road. Yeah, just do, doing uh, some interviews and uh, stacking up episodes. So uh, we hope you guys enjoyed this episode, uh, the War on Drugs, and we can't wait to uh, produce what we have coming next. Yeah, we had definitely asked that you subscribe to our podcast wherever you find podcasts. Of course, iTunes, Google Play, or you know your podcast app. Uh, subscribe, uh, share. You know, in any way you can, uh, spread the love a little bit because obviously, the more ears that hear the story, it makes us feel good but much more importantly these are issues that are relevant today even though they they're, it's sort of a historical tale uh, and they they really connect the dots a little bit between uh, again where these things started where they went where they are and where they're going and it's really important I mean you might not have somebody in your family that's been affected by the by the drug you know epidemic although you probably you probably do uh, but you're certainly a taxpayer. You know, and so there's there's financial ramifications, there's societal ramifications to to this particular issue and to a lot of the issues that we're going to be covering in future Newsbeat episodes. So whatever you can do to kind of, you know, stick with us and uh, let us know what you think. You could also send us emails if you have any comments about this uh, episode or suggestions for future episodes, uh, tips or anything that you think, you know, we might be covering. Or just kind of, you know, say, hey, you guys are doing great. We love that. You can send us emails at newsbeat at moreypublishing.com, M-O-R-E-Y publishing.com. And like I said, just you know, stay tuned, man. We got we got a lot more coming. You'll learn a lot from this episode. Uh, I know for a fact that the entire uh, Newsbeat crew did researching and and working on this. And if you look at the the trillion dollars spent, the fifty thousand overdose deaths uh, in two thousand fifteen, the growing incarceration rates, the opioid epidemic, it also make you question if this was spent toward this war, what's the solution? I think at the minimum, uh, and I hope you will too, that it demands re-examination. And I'll leave you with uh, just two more things. Um, As you'll hear in the uh, cold open of the episode, that is an actual congressional hearing, a congressional setting, in which an expert is asking a sitting lawmaker if they knew who Harry Anslinger is. And this lawmaker says no. And this is the guy, the chief... The drug czar before there was drug czars who came in and changed everything about how America and other countries saw drugs. And in one of the other quotes attributed to Anslinger, which I'll leave you with, he said, Reefer makes darkies think they're as good as white men. And I think that's all you need to know about Harry Anslinger. There it is. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Backbeat. We'll be back with our next episode.